It was all rolling hills and the first thing we did was terrace it into three different terraces. This upper terrace here has 200 trees on it. Uh, we planted them on a 10 by 8 grid and some of the trees we did a double planting on as far as for a windbreak but we found out that it didn't work and the trees were actually competing for nutrients and water so we've gone through a major re pruning and stumping of the farm so on this terrace as it wraps around we will plant um, another 180 trees on this terrace and then on the third terrace down below we can get another 70 trees for a total grow out of close to 600 trees within the two acres good mycelia and growth in here i mean it's extremely fertile soil no compaction so this will make a great home for for the first planting out oh this is the kanaka copa the heirloom hawaiian coffee that we brought down from the watershed um, with the blm coffee is an invasive plant so we removed 300 trees from the watershed and this is the first generation of, of typica you can see with a corrugated leaf shows that it's the kanaka copa and then the bronze tips on the new leaves does show that it is a typica variety so these trees are five years old we planted them in the clump just as we found them in the watershed and uh, they were at the state where they just had two true leaves and you can see this is just for demonstration but we leave overripes on and we have some color coming in and some fruit but we wanted to leave these trees in a more natural setting as this was the first set of coffee that we brought down from the farm up above in the watershed when we first got into the coffee the university recommended that we stump the trees at about a foot off the ground and go with four verticals that worked fine for the first three years last year our fruit set was ho so heavy with the three verticals that we had trees splitting so we ended up having to stump the trees again take them all the way down and now we've raised the elevation to where the head of the tree is at knee height and we're only going with three verticals this tree here you can see now has three verticals and of course all these suckers here will come off as before we had two large verticals coming out here and you, as you can see it was way below the recommended height of knee height that was causing such a structure within the tree that was causing it to split and that's where we that's where we were getting the severe tree damage so with the pruning and only having the three verticals it's opened up the interior of the tree to get much more light on the big island we've had coffee berry borer disease beetles and we don't have them on this island but we have some traps on the farm for detection that we monitor just to make sure that we don't have infestation and you can see on this tree fruit set it's pretty decent so this is the geisha coffee that we brought from panama and did a quarantine grow out with the state they came out of quarantine on april 13th and the quarantine room is this eight by eight cinder block room with screens on two of the windows we had to bring in our own light and our own obviously irrigation for it we needed to bring the trees out to where they would harden up and get a little bit more natural wood be in the wind so they would stiffen up and get a little bit more natural light these trees are now at the point to where they're starting to branch and they've got good wood structure good root structure and they're air pruning and these are ready to get planted out in the field within the month this will be the first experiment with geisha coffee in the hawaiian islands the university has one tree and that's the only tree that we've been able to find it's a geisha variety what we'll be doing is we'll be doing an interplanting between these trees 
on the rows. So we'll be bringing in another 300 trees up here and we'll use the existing Kanaka Copa as a windbreak shade break while the while the geisha coffee is developing. Then at year five we'll end up removing probably 200 of the Kanaka Copa keeping the original trees up at the front and changing out the farm to geisha coffee. For shade and windbreak we grow the holly koa and this koa here is four years old. We've had a black Hawaiian stink bug that's caused a lot of damage. We've lost 20 trees on the farm already but this tree too is also a nitrogen fixing tree. It gives great litter also. This is another nitrogen fixing tree. This is the Hawaiian um, ice cream bean tree. It gets a very long bean and uh, they say that if you boil it it actually has tastes like vanilla ice cream so we'll see in the future. For a cover crop in addition to the mulch we grow a perennial peanut which is a nitrogen fixing ground cover. The one thing about the peanut um, it doesn't take it doesn't use a whole lot of water and it, it, it does well with the birds in the area along with the cowpea. So we grow cowpea for a nitrogen fixer also. We were experimenting with a new cover crop. This is oilseed radish or white mustard. And the great thing about the radish, it has a very long taproot. It brings all the nutrients out of the ground and the minerals up through the leaves and then we go ahead and come through with a weed whacker take the radish out let it decompose so now all these nutrients are back at the top of the ground letting the root decompose in the ground bringing up the organic matter within the root within the soils and it's opened the soil up and it's helped on the drainage this is an Australian butterfly pea the blue flower is what they make um, organic edible food dye, blue food dyes from. And the great thing about this flower, it's got a nice peppery bite to it, so it makes a nice edible flower in a salad. Um, it's real hard to find this color in a salad topping, and it's again a nitrogen fixing crop, but it's a, it's a very, very lovely flower, and it's got a nice peppery bite to it. We also have nasturtiums and there's some cowpea, lima beans and whole beans in through this area. Again, just to build up the organic matter, add some benefit for the bird population and for us to have a little something to graze on. Lots of ladybugs both adults and youth. So they're de definitely doing their job because the aphid infestation is coming is going away and it's great seeing. They found studies that when you do have pollinators and bees on the farm you have gotten a higher yield so we're just working with nature and putting up a good host for the natural or the smaller pollinators to work the farm. We do have plans in the future to bring hives onto the farm but uh, as yet we haven't gotten into the construction of them. This is our Pentagos Eco Wet Mill 500. It will do 500 kilos of coffee an hour. It's still bucket based driven it's from a farm standpoint. This is the hopper where the coffee cherries go through. This auger takes it into this cone drum, which removes the parchment. The parchment comes down the chute and auger and goes out the wall, carrying the trash to the compost bin. The coffee beans come down this chute. This auger and separator separates the overripes and the greens. The coffee fruit then falls down through here into the mechanical demucilage. 
The mechanical demucilage has an auger screw that brings the coffee up, applying pressure against these veins, extracting the pectins. This, this control valve here allows the pressure for how much pressure is put on the beans, and then the coffee comes out with the pectins removed here, ready to go on the drying rack so that we don't have to do a water fermentation. This saves extremely large amount of water on the farm and it gives us the opportunity to get the water, coffee on the drying rack two days earlier or to produce a honey style coffee. This is our dry mill for removing the parchment and dry coffee goes in here when it's at about 11 percent moisture with the parchment on it after it's milled the coffee comes out and it's still at between 10 to 12 percent moisture so it's not quite ready to go necessarily into the roaster but sometimes it is but it, it does a nice product as far as removing the parchment and polishing the silver skin so we're fortunate today we've got two roasters on the farm we have the one pound san franciscan roaster and then our dear friends Patsy and Roby Price have a six pound roaster that they've parked here on the farm until they get their roasting facility up and built. It's nice playing with the two roasters, getting one profile started on one roaster and then implementing it into the six pound roaster, eventually moving up into yet another larger roaster. One of the things what we wanted to make sure when people get home is that they could reproduce their coffee as they had on the farm. So we took four Mr. Coffees, rewired them so they can all brew at the same time. So when people come to the farm, we can do four flights of coffee as a sampling. Regardless of what we call it, we've just color coded the pots. So if she likes the yellow one and he likes the red one, we can talk about the nuances between those two coffees. Regardless of the name, all they remember is that, you know what, when I went to the farm, I liked the green coffee. We wanted them to experience on the farm what they would have at home, and we think that this is a great way to do it. 